to you all uh, for this, uh, the afternoon's first panel to mark the launch of the Asia Society's Center for China Analysis. I'm Susan Jakes. I'm the editor of the online magazine China File. And our topic for the next 40 minutes or so is the upcoming uh, 20th National Congress of the Chinese Communist Party, which begins later this month. During the Congress, we will learn the names of the 25 men and possibly women who, as members of the party's Politburo, will assume leadership of the country. We'll also find out who will be among the much smaller number of people, most likely just seven, most likely just men, uh, who will sit on the Politburo's standing committee at the fulcrum of political power in China. Are you um, saying, Susie, that it's a male-dominated party? It is a bit. Um, see our website for details. Um, <laughs> Uh, and they will become China's supreme leaders at a time when the country faces a host of complex challenges, both domestically and in terms of China's relationship uh, with other parts of the world. The Congress will also mark Xi Jinping's bid for reappointment to a third five-year term as the CCP's general secretary, uh, advancing the changes that he began in 2018 uh, when he pushed through an amendment to China's constitution, allowing to him to serve as president, that is, head of state, for longer than his immediate predecessors, and perhaps uh, setting the scene to rule the country uh, more indefinitely. Uh, who China's new leaders may be, uh, how they will w relate to one another, and what their selection will mean for the future shape of China's politics and economy is the topic of our discussion today. Uh, but, but before I introduce this highly distinguished panel, um, I want to note that decoding China's 20th Party Congress is not only the name of this panel, uh, but also of an evolving digital tool and collection of analysis uh, that our panelists, along with CCA's managing director Chen Jing and assistant director Nathan Levine, uh, have just published. Uh, on Asia Society's website, you can find this amazing tool, and it uh, allows you to explore the likely candidates for the Politburo and the many layers of connection among them, who went to school with whom, whose ancestors hail from the same province, uh, which ones worked on which pieces of uh, the policy portfolio, and so on. Um, and these are all factors, these are all um, characteristics that may play some role uh, in who's ultimately uh, selected and then how they will rule. So when this panel is over, uh, and as it inevitably will, it leaves you wanting much more, I encourage you to go out into the lobby uh, where we have computers set up so that you can explore this tool uh, or to do so when you get home tonight. Uh, on to the panel. Uh, so arrayed before you are four preeminent experts on the subject of politics in China. Uh, Asia Society's president and CEO, the Honorable Dr. Kevin Rudd, uh, Chris Johnson, a longtime analyst of uh, China's leadership politics both inside and outside of U.S. government, who now serves as the Center for China Analysis Senior Fellow for Domestic Politics, Ma Guanan. Uh, who is CCA's senior fellow for the economy uh, and served for many years at the Bank of International Settlement. Uh, and last but not least, Wu Guo Guang, who is also a senior fellow for domestic politics uh, and on top of his other distinctions, uh, is the only one uh, among us, probably the only person in this room, uh, who has seen a party congress from the inside when he helped prepare for the 13th party congress which he says is ancient history, but I think also quite relevant. Um, I remember when I first arrived in Beijing 20 years ago at just on the eve of the 16th Party Congress, and I was puzzling about how I was going to cover it. As a journalist, I called up my editor, and he said, well, before you do anything else, call Wu Guoguang. So it's especially nice to have him. That's also ancient history. That was in the Jiang Hu era. So, um, now we're going to just get into it. And I think we're going to start with you, Kevin. Um, the keen listeners among you or anybody who was here for our earlier panel will know that uh, Kevin has recently added 
a new honorific to his fairly extensive collection. He's now Dr. Kevin Rudd, and Oxford University bestowed this title upon him in recognition of his deep immersion over the past several years in the thought and political philosophy of Xi Jinping, a hobby that is, let's just say, not for the faint of heart, which I think is also the title of your autobiography. right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but which has led him to remarkable insights about both the substance and the function of ideology in Xi Jinping's hands and the degree to which uh, it's central to governance in China today. So Kevin, I just want to start by asking you uh, to give us an overview of how ideology will play a role in the Congress and what it's likely to mean for the practice of governance going forward. Good, thanks, Susie. Um, we're all dating our antiquity. 13th Party Congress, 16th Party Congress. When was your first Party Congress that you covered? Okay, I was there for the 12th. <laughs> well, actually, not exactly the 12th Party Congress, but between the 12th and the 13th. Remember the Special Party Congress of 1984? 85? 85. So there you go. I'm, I'm sort of, I have a 12th in front of my credentials. That makes us all antiques up here, apart from Susie. Uh, a few words on ideology and why it matters. Um, we became accustomed in the period of Deng Xiaoping uh, and Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao to think that ideology was largely dead, that Marxism-Leninism as an ideology was a piece of, shall we say, camouflage uh, over the top of what was becoming a rambunctious, rolling, basically, Chinese semi-capitalist, state capitalist uh, economy with episodic uh, experiments in one form of political liberalization or another, mostly unsuccessful, sometimes partially successful, sometimes within the party, sometimes within the public, and a gradually opening Chinese society as well. That, in my, the argument of, in the dissertation I've just written uh, at Oxford, um, that age comes to an end with Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping is China's ideologist in chief, and he takes ideology and the ideology of Marxism Leninism seriously. And because of that, uh, you see this reflected in so many things that he does. My summary comment, and then I'm, I'm more interested, Susie, and I'm sure the audience is, in hearing from the other experts in the field, is that if you trace back over the last 10 years, he's made three ideological changes. Number one, for reasons of party preservation for the long term, he's moved Chinese politics towards the Leninist left in order to re-entrench the power of the party over the totality of the economy and society rather than being at the margins, which is where it was going under previous general secretaries. And that furthermore, within that, he has uh, asserted the centrality of his leadership over the collective leadership. That's one big ideological shift. The second is in his second term in particular from 2017 to the present, uh, has, he's moved the center of gravity of Chinese economic policy to the Marxist left. Greater role for the state over the economy, greater role for SOEs, a more constrained role for the private sector, a wholesale assault on tech platforms, uh, the property sector, parts of finance, and a new common prosperity agenda. And a rebirth of industrial scale planning backed up by massive industrial uh, development funds uh, which have uh, reconsolidated the power of the central planners uh, in the system. And in my argument, flowing through to policy has led in one respect to slowing Chinese economic growth. And the third ideological change in what I describe as Xi Jinping's overall ideological project of Marxist nationalism, if he's pushed politics to the left through Leninism, the economy to the left through Marxism, he's pushed nationalism to the right through a more assertive foreign and security policy. And we've seen this unfold really since about 2014 and with growing intensity as Deng's old doctrine of hide your strength, bide your time, never take the lead, uh, has yielded to a new Xi Jinping doctrine of striving for achievement, changing the regional and global status quo in a manner more compatible with China's national interests and values. 
concluding point from me is that why does ideology matter? It doesn't just matter because it matters to Xi Jinping. It matters because if you look at the history of the show from 1921 and certainly from 1949, when there is a profound ideological change at the top, it becomes the headwaters of subsequent policy change in the real world of economic policy and other forms of foreign policy as well. We saw that in the Deng period where Deng basically said, uh, stop disputing ideology, uh, and instead get on with the practical business of developing the economy. And that became the organizing principle for 35 years. What this guy has said is that ideology is back on top, Marxism and Leninism in particular. And what we see is that when that change occurs at the top, that it does flow through to the rest of policy beneath as well. And that, I think, is why when we look at the 20th Party Congress, my core focus for the analysis will be the ideological content of Xi Jinping's work report uh, to the Congress and what the textual changes will be in that report compared with the 19th and 18th Party Congresses which preceded it. So there you go. That, that's my initial thought. I think that sets us up well. I think let's save the policy piece for a minute. And Chris, maybe I can ask you to pick up on the first uh, of uh, the uses of ideology that Kevin identified. You know, we've watched over the last several months as rumors, some of them seemingly based on deep information, some of them based on much less information, have swirled around um, Xi's relative uh, grip on power and whether it's slipping. And I wonder if maybe you can respond a little bit to what Kevin said, but also give us your sense of how you're reading where she is sitting right now, um, to the extent it's even possible. For those of us thanks, um, who've been doing this for a long time, uh, arguably this is the most puzzling pre-conference period that we've had uh, in, in some time, in part because we're entering uncharted waters with him likely staying around for a third term. So in previous last couple of episodes of this uh, film that we've seen, a leader is departing, a new one is coming, right? And that obviously sets the table in a very unique way. This time, the key leader is saying. So in my mind, a lot of the bits and pieces that we're all usually so focused on, such as what will the standing committee look like, what will the Politburo look like, they're fascinating from a China politics geek point of view, but I'm not sure they're as meaningful, you know, in terms of policy consequences as they have been historically. And to pick up on Kevin's point about ideology, and this is, in my opinion, why I don't think Xi Jinping is on shaky ground at all uh, politically, is that if he's had a masterstroke, it was to begin in a very methodical way uh, this campaign of ideological aggrandizement for himself personally, putting aside the policy aspects that, that Kevin had mentioned. And that started almost immediately when he took power in 2012 by framing the history of the CCP in these three epochs, right? You know, the period under Mao, the period of Deng and those other guys that we don't talk about anymore, and then the Xi Jinping's new era, right? Um, oh, each roughly about 30 years, which says something about what the Xi Jinping's new era will be like, you know, so I think that's very valuable. And then obviously getting his eponymous contribution, uh, Xi Jinping thought for horribly long name, as I like to call it, uh, into the party constitution in 2017 is a big deal for a number of reasons. One, it speaks to his personal power. But two, as Kevin was alluding to earlier, it makes it much more difficult within their system to oppose the policies of that leader if they have that ideological standing because you're no longer attacking Xi Jinping as an individual or the party secretary, you're attacking the party's line. And that's a very dangerous game within their system. You can do it, but you better win. <laughs> if you're going to do it. And I expect that similarly at the 20th Party Congress, he will achieve uh, truncating that horribly long name just down to Xi Jinping thought. And that would put him, of course, on a par with only Mao Zedong, right? And then in my mind, it becomes even more difficult uh, for folks to push back on policy. So when we saw rumors over the spring and, and, you know, just constantly really for the last several years, but particularly in the spring where this idea of after a series of policy setbacks, and Kevin and Dr. Kissinger spoke about the Russia piece, which I agree with all their commentary, zero COVID, you know, these controversial policies that he's been pursuing, 
that somehow there was a notion that uh, pushback was occurring, uh, or worse, even that people were taking the fight to Xi Jinping. And in my mind, I've seen no evidence to suggest that that's happening. There's a lot of people who don't like Xi Jinping and who grumble about him ceaselessly within the system. My focus as an analyst is, does it meaningfully move the dial on policy? And in my opinion, I've not seen anything that has thus far. All right, well, then that's a good excuse to move to the policy front itself. In addition to the challenges that Chris just mentioned that are going to face this new group of leaders, um, the economic picture has been somewhat choppy over the last uh, year. There's issues in the real estate market, youth unemployment, a variety of other issues. I wonder if you could just talk to us a little bit about what kinds of economic policies we're likely to see in the coming months and, and how they're related to what's actually going to take place in October, if at all. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, despite some tentative and hopeful signs of economic stabilization emerging in the past few weeks, um, based on my latest reading uh, of the data, uh, the Chinese economy has been struggling, to say the least. And at one point, has been fairly gloomy. Uh, mostly owing to a, a combination of um, very ugly and adverse uh, shocks to the economy. Uh, some of these shocks are externally uh, imposed, not much you can do. For example, the invasion of uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, as well as the ongoing trade and technology tension with the U.S. But in my view, at least this year, most of the shocks to the Chinese economy came from the domestic front. One is the rapidly aging population. Another is the. Mm, excessive leverage uh, in, the, in the property sector, in the Chinese property sector. But however, there's a crucial difference between the property rules in China now and the property rules in the US uh, 10, 15 years ago uh, in the sublime crisis. The excessive leverage uh, in, the, in the US 15 years ago, property uh, leverage has more to do with the uh, home buyer Whereas in China, it's been mostly related to the property developer them, themselves. So there's a crucial distinction there. But there's a, a lot of linkage, common linkage between these two uh, crises as well. So I won't have to spend time to on it. Most importantly, some of the adverse shocks we are seeing so far this year has been policy induced by the government itself. This policy, for example, includes the very stringent zero COVID measures, which is very costly, very painful. The abrupt enforcement of the uh, three red lines on the financing or leveraging of the property developers, and the very hasty and very erratic regulatory reset over the mostly private uh, inter uh, technology platform sector, as mentioned by Kevin. So the question is that, as the party congress approaches, what would be the likely interaction between the politics on the one hand and the economics on the other? My view is that it's getting trickier and less favorable. On the one hand, poor economic performance will undermine or at least weaken the legitimacy of the current party leadership. On the other hand, on the eve of the party congress, it also becomes harder to meaningfully adapt the signature economic policy. Uh, China nowadays adopted nobody dare to make a major move, even on the economic front. <clears throat> so hence, both politics and economics become straight jockey together. No one dare to boldly offer competing, but potentially more pragmatic economic advice and this will only make the economy even uh, uh, harder to manage, which in turn probably will add to the political attention uh, internally. So the next question will be that, 
After party party congress, what may be the overall economic policy regime going forward? Um, I see two possible paths going forward. As economists, you always say things on the one hand and on the other. <laughs> so, um, the good path is the a less rigid and more pragmatic uh, policy making, which typically features an enhanced role for the private sector and the market uh, as well, because the market has to be more efficient in terms of resources and allocation, and private sector is more dynamic. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> And uh, the market tends to be more efficient in terms of resources and allocation. The private sector tends to be the most dynamic. When you have these two things going on, then economic challenge can be better managed. But the bad part will be even blunder, more rigid, and even more corner solution type of economic policy we are seeing more and more often in recent years, which tend to be associated more closely with bigger state roles and even personal, strong personal view as well. So the newly chosen the economic team may provide some hint as to which positive paths we are likely to see going forward. One final observation, most of the observers, China observers here will agree that it used to be the case that economic development is the, or if not, among the top priority uh, for, for, for China. But in recent years, the importance of economic development appears to have ranked noticeably lower on more and more and more occasions. I would stop here. In relation to what? What's, what's rising if... In relation to any other policy goal. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, well, Wu Go Guang, you're going to be... Uh, you're going to be left with the task of sort of tying this all together. But I wonder, you know, um, Chris says, and I, this is my analysis too, that, that there are a lot of people who don't necessarily like Xi Jinping very much. We may have a struggling environment for um, nimble economic policy change. What, what is this likely to mean for this new up-and-coming uh, and when we say up and coming, we don't really mean young people, but different new generation of Chinese leaders who um, are about to uh, you know, assume responsibility for this uh, pretty complicated and challenging picture. And Thank you, Susie. That's really a thoughtful question because it highlights one of those key issues confronting the 20th Party Congress. To my point of view, uh, he's continues uh, staying in power yeah, for the third term at the last, and also the composition of the next top leadership, particularly the Politburo Standing Committee, and who would be the Prime Minister, that's the second key question. And the third one is just what you tried to highlight, the generational renewal of CCP elite, particularly yeah, mid-level, high-level elite. Uh, actually, <clears throat> in our preliminary studies, uh, we found that the current, the, cur the average age of current ministry level, uh, uh, vice ministry level CCP cadres, the average age of them today is much higher than that of them peers 10 years ago and also 20 years ago. So uh, basically, uh, based on the statistics of the last reshuffling of the provincial party standing committee, among those 30, no, sorry, 315 uh, so-called uh, provincial standing committee members, except party secretary and governor. So only 69, they were born in the early, in the 1970s. So roughly 22% of those guys, they were born in the 1970s. Uh, I don't have actually similar statistics available for how about the situation 10 years ago, but 20 years ago. But I can give you some 
personal, I mean, stories of those leaders' personal careers. For example, Li Keqiang, he became uh, full minister in his age of 38. And Zhao Leji became deputy governor, provinci provincial governor in 37. Uh, uh, Wang, Wang, uh, Wang Yang became deputy provincial governor in 38. And also the late Commerce Xi Jinping, actively, yeah, he became uh, deputy provi uh, provincial governor in 43. And all of them, they became provincial governors or party secretaries in their 40s. And today, the youngest provincial governor in China, Zhao Long in Fujian province, he was born in 1967. You can calculate how old he is, 55 already. And he became provincial governor only in the last year. And also the youngest provincial party secretaries in today's China, four of them, they were born in 1964. So uh, they, were, they became party provincial secretary. Yeah, only the most senior became party secretary of the province of Shanxi before the last year. And, and what do you think this is about? Why, why are yeah, such good elderly leaders being... So why they scab of elder. age like this? So basically, I think because when Xi Jinping came into power, actually all around him, those young people who were promoted by Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao. Yeah, so basically, in long term, there are three high tide of generational renewal of CCP uh, leading cadres at this level, just like uh, Kevin mentioned in mid-1980s. So that special party congress renewed uh, the party bureau with promotion of a lot of younger leaders, including uh, those, you know, Wu Bangguo, Hu Jintao, those guys. And in late 1990s, uh, when Jiang Zemin consolidated his power, he promoted a lot of young guys to these levels. Those people Xi Jinping, Li Keqiang, they got opportunity in that wave. And the third one, yeah, with Hu Jintao, of course, because Hu Jintao, his power base is with communist young League, and those young guys, they got advantage with this career. And so when Xi Jinping came to power, so all around him, I don't know these guys, actually, so he needed to renew the elite, but he didn't want to, those guys were really in advance advantage because of their ages. So Xi Jinping's basic strategy of elite circulation was to block those younger guys' career rather than promote young people. So usually we think that younger age is really beneficial factor for political career. Yes, yeah, early births get warm, the warmth. But you can also imagine that the early warmth, how they're actively fit. They are eaten by birds. So Xi Jinping is that big bird, eating those early worms promoted by Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao. So that's why the story like today. So uh, also, you know the case, the youngest Politburo member, Sun Zhengcai, five years ago. Yeah, just because he was the youngest guy, so he was purged. I guess also, of course, easy to find excuse to purge him, uh, corruption, things like that. I want to come back to the rest of you, and, but I just want to press on this a little more. What, so what is going to, what do you imagine is going to happen now? Yeah. Are, are some of these younger people going to finally be elevated, or are the, have they just been... Yeah, back to the out. 20s party congress, uh, the youngest party member, actually three of them, they were born in early 1960s. If the Communist Party still follows the rule of age sailing, so-called when you got 67 years old, you could continue your term, and 68, you have to retire. That means for the next, I mean, not 20th Party Congress, five years later, only three guys, they would stay, stay in power. That could be big gap, actually, in terms of a continuous power governance, things like that. So in terms of this, we can speculate that for the 20th Party Congress, at least five or even some more, of younger guys who were born in the 1960s would be promoted into the Politburo. And for the lower levels, 
I would like to see in the next five years. If Xi Jinping really consolidates the power uh, through this you know, 20 party congress, and he will try to promote a lot of younger guys to higher positions, uh, maybe that can be predicted. Hmm. I will stop here. Thank That's you. Very interesting. Um, I thought we could do, we just have a few more minutes, but I thought we could do a little bit of a, a lightning round. I'm a journalist, and so one of the things that it strikes me so much when I have a conversation like this, or when I read the work that you uh, have published on the Asia Society website, is just how little information we actually have about any of this, and you all do an amazing job with little information, uh, and using it to derive quite astute analysis. But I just wonder, I wanted to ask each of you, if there were one piece of information right now that you could get your fingers on that would help you clarify your analysis of what is happening in Beijing right now, what would it be? I'll start with you. Well, given I'm the ideology guy here, the... Um... I mean, you have volumes of things to read. Maybe <laughs> you have too much. No, 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 no. The, the ideology stuff I think is important, and I'll make this lightning roundish. Um, as I said before, I'm looking, what I'd really like to have my hands on now is the draft of the ideology statement uh, at the 20th Party Congress, which seeks to build on what the 19th Party Congress said was the central, quote, contradiction or the central challenge of the party for the period ahead. Um, because uh, last time round, that represented a significant correction to the left which gave rise to all the subsequent policies that I believe we have seen. But the other one that I'm looking for, Susie, at the ideological level is, does the 19th Party, was the 20th Party Congress uh, report going to contain a continuation of the phrase used since 2002, which is that China is in a period of strategic opportunity, or will it be removed? I suspect it will be removed um, and that we'll have a new phraseology which will point to China's formal ideological conclusion using their own dialectical analysis that it is an adverse strategic environment which they now face and which, without wishing to sound too dramatic, begins to put the party and the country, therefore, on a level of military preparedness for future contingencies. I'm looking for that, and I wish I had access to it now. And and for me, Chris. <laughs> um, I, I I would want to know two things because I think it's uh, fundamentally important, and I think it's the things we're all scratching our heads about. The first is when will they end the zero COVID policy, um, and the second is how will they change their approach on wolf warriorism in their foreign policy. Um, and I think it's important on a number of fronts. The first, of course, is, as I mentioned earlier, Xi Jinping isn't going anywhere, right? So we're sort of in this position now, and um, I, I, I think I have a slightly different view than Guo Guang. My view is that he consolidated power at the latest in 2017. I actually think he consolidated power before that. So this, these iterations have been really the further articulation of his leadership supremacy in my mind. So we need to know, does this guy have what we might call ideational flexibility <laughs> to be able to change these policies. So in my mind, that's very important. And to Kevin's point about the period of strategic opportunity, I believe that for a long time as well. In fact, Xi Jinping has effectively been undermining it since his first foreign uh, affairs work conference in 2014. The speech there began to question that. He's built his entire power and it's helped him justify the power grab that he's done by creating a sense of urgency and even danger in the international environment. All of his speeches are full of it. So that then would suggest to me that we won't know about this wolf warriorism. We're more likely to see consistency. But those two issues, ending zero COVID and the wolf warriorism, because as we all do, when we see them doing things that don't make sense you know, from a Western point of view or even from just a conventional wisdom point of view, we have to ask ourselves two questions. You know, what do they know or perhaps better, what do they assess that we do not that make them think these things are smart? Uh, and oftentimes I think it is their dialectical mindset that leads them to these conclusions. Or the second one is, have they begun to believe so much in their asymptotic rise and so on and so forth that they don't realize they're making these policy mistakes? And to Kevin's point, I think that's a much more dangerous spot for all of us. Uh, 
Uh, one favorite uh, tea leaves I am uh, watching closely in the Chinese economy is to look at the advertisements put up by the local, local governments regarding uh, advertisements. Advertisements, yeah put up by the local governments regarding the long-term franchise operating rights of their local operations, including, for example, par parks or the, 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 even the cafeteria of the local, local government. 30 years of operating rights. And people will ask why did they, they're doing that. So one possible explanation is it's a sign of looming fiscal stress at all levels of the government. Thank you. That was fascinating. Okay. If you just start talking, it will automatically. Yes, uh, I'll be very brief. Yeah. So actually, uh, it's a really big challenge uh, to us to understand Chinese politics. Uh, I, I, I would say experience doesn't matter, uh, actually, because as I mentioned, yeah, you experienced only in the past, and uh, everything changed. You know that China is in the new era of Xi Jinping. So the logic could be fundamentally different. And also, uh, a lot of uh, you know, social science knowledge could be, uh, I don't know, I would say, uh, seems that China challenges uh, social science studies. But still, I feel that uh, uh, there is a joke and you know, saying that there are two, large, two kinds of logics in the world, the logic and also the Chinese logic. So uh, actively, I found that, you know, I got to train political science training uh, in this country. Uh, so I found that this training is really helpful uh, for me to, you know, when I look back at my experience in China, I got a lot of things. And when I was in Beijing, I didn't understand. But uh, Western training really helps. So actively, I would say uh, 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 we can actually use, for example, yeah, Chris just mentioned something about the power. Actually, yeah, power logic, yeah, is something Chinese leadership particularly follows. So I got so theory about the international realists, things like that, and those kind of things. Machiavelli understands power logics much much better than Confucius. So actually, that really helps. Thank you. Well, thank you so much uh, to uh, all. Can I throw a question across? Because I know we've got to finish. Just because just, you just mentioned having been trained in China. Uh, Chris just mentioned, and I mentioned before, dialectical training, dialectical thinking. Um, in your training and two logics, to what extent is Chinese logic Confucian or dialectical in the way in which they look and observe current reality? And how do either of those traditions fundamentally differ from the Western tradition you've been trained in? I'm quite interested in that difference. Sorry. No, great question. Uh, I, I would say uh, both logics, Confucian logic and Machiavelli logic, they apply to understanding China pretty well. I guess, I don't know, uh, Western society are basically operating following Machiavelli logic, uh, but China actually likes to play so-called uh, two-faced, genu yeah, generous actually faced strategy. So in daily life, in you know, uh, public conversation, everybody used moral conversation, moral moral norms to understand everything, to treat each other. But behind, they use. Machiavelli logic to treat each other. So if we understand how these two different logics, they apply to different occasions of Chinese politics, maybe better we can understand Chinese politics. That's my only really two cents. Satisfied? Okay. Well, thanks so much to all of you, and I encourage all of you to keep an eye on the Center for China Analysis, where you will soon find uh, writing from all of these gentlemen.